officer at the Spokane Regional Health District, which monitors community health and provides educational outreach to residents and local policymakers. Having practiced family medicine for many years, Dr. Lutz now works to inform the public about the societal factors impacting well-being and bridging the divide between policy and public health. I think uh, both of the speakers will speak for about 20 minutes or so, and then we're going to open it up for a few questions and answers uh, at the end of the event. So join me now in welcoming our guest, Welcome to Boston. <laughs> welcoming our guest, Welcome to Boston. Um, my background is family medicine. And honestly, three or four years ago, if you would have asked me what I knew about addiction, I would say, well, people are addicted. And it's fundamentally a problem with them. And I did not know that this is really what we have now, what I've now come to understand as a chronic brain disorder. And one that, again, I think that too many of us don't realize, certainly in public health, we look at a lot of the factors that cause people to be addicted. And again, we'll talk about that a little bit today. But again, for me, it was a real sort of eye-opener that the individuals who so oftentimes I had marginalized and thought of, thought of very despairingly, really just have the individuals who so oftentimes I had marginalized and thought of beautiful flower, thought of very despairingly. It's amazing to think that this is the really just to have the some individuals who this is papaverse and somniferum. It's the opium poppy flower, thought of very despairingly. It's amazing to think this is the really just to have thousands of individuals who this is papaverse and somniferum. It's the opium poppy flower, thought of very despairingly. It's amazing to think this is the really just to have thousands of individuals who this is papaverse continent and far east by the Silk Road. Wars have been fought over it. When India uh, sort of took over, uh, well, I'm sorry, when England took over India, they found uh, the poppy to be growing quite well. Uh, it was a very good industry for them. They also fought wars in China because, again, unfortunately, with opium, they were able to find a significant percentage of the Chinese who became addicted. Okay, it actually ended up that the selling of opium tended to actually provide a lot of money to the East India Company to subsidize products going back to England and Europe. Statistics, numbers, I mean again, these are the numbers we've heard. Again, you'll hear these. Again, 2017 data, again a little bit a little bit dated, mind you, but nonetheless, look at the number of drug overdoses and again how many of them are directly related to opioids. Pretty phenomenal. That's 192 deaths a day. I mean, that's if we had though if we had that kind of statistics in the past, we would have been a lot more aggressive about it. But again, that's what's happening right now. I point out the fact that although for many situations we like to blame physicians, because again, indeed, the statistics show that unfortunately prescriptions have started addictions in many people. 191 million <laughs> prescriptions, because again, indeed, the statistics show in that unfortunately prescriptions have started That was when the most prescriptions were 191 million prescriptions, that's almost one because again, indeed, the statistics show that unfortunately prescriptions have started That was when in Washington State, our daily prescriptions were almost one because again, in 2008, but 2012 ended up being the peak for prescription writing. Unfortunately, what we've seen is that as prescriptions have gone down, people unfortunately find themselves addicted to opioids. And so what's happened? We've seen now that the illicit manufacturing of fentanyl, which is coming from overseas, has again been on the rise both nationally and now in Washington state. And it's actually accounting for a significantly increasing percentage of individuals who are dying. They're using fentanyl, not realizing that the heroin they may have been using in the past is now laced with fentanyl. They have a known dose of heroin that they've been using maybe for years, and all of a sudden they find that, wow, this dose that I'm used to is no longer the dose that is safe for me. I also note the fact that look at 550,000 naloxone prescriptions. We'll talk a little bit about naloxone, but naloxone is a medication, it's an opioid reversing drug. And it's now being made available throughout the country. Washington State, just this past year, allowed Kathy Lofi, uh, the state health officer, to provide a prescription to anyone who wants it. They can literally go in to a pharmacy and say, I would like a prescription for naloxone. And under, under Dr. Lofi's signature, she can, they can have that prescription filled. 
So again, I think we need to look at a little bit of history. And as I mentioned to you, opium, the opium poppy has been around for millennia. <coughs> opium has been around for millennia. And opium, again, unfortunately, opium dens back at the turn of the 19th and 20th centuries. Opium came to the United States with the Chinese coming over for the um, gold rush. And opium dens formed in Chinatowns. And then what's interesting is that back in the, back in the early 1800s, a German chemist was able to isolate morphine from opium. And morphine became a drug that was not necessarily looked upon disparagingly, not looked upon bad, because it, was, it helped people sleep. And interestingly enough, the very first people, the very first, if you will, people who became addicted were moms. Moms. Because pharmacists were encouraging mothers and physicians were encouraging mothers to take cough medicine or AIDS to help them sleep. Or maybe give their children cough drops. Or uh, for, to address tooth, tooth pain. So cocaine and morphine, they were the first two drugs, if you will, pharmaceutical drugs, prescription drugs, as of 1917, that were really the first addictive prescription medications in the United States. These are just a couple of images of a variety of products that were over the counter. Coca-Cola, of course, we know cocaine was the magic ingredient. Just a couple of others. In the late 1800s, the, the syringe was developed. And that became seen as a more efficient way of delivering medication. Again, it's thought to be in the late 1800s, and heroin was actually was derived in the late 1800s. And that became seen as a more safer safer way of delivering medication. Again, more thought to be in the late 1800s, and heroin was actually was derived in the late 1800s. And that became seen as a more safer way of delivering medication. Again, more thought to be in the late 1800s, and heroin was actually was derived in the late 1800s. And that became seen as a more safer addiction to an opioid, to morphine. And now what are we dealing with? We're dealing with prescription medications, such as hydrocodone, Vicodin, oxycodone, oxycontin. Okay, we're also talking about, again, street drugs, illicit drugs, like heroin, like illicitly manufactured fentanyl. And when we look at the opioid epidemic, we look upon it essentially in three waves. The first wave, came about in the mid-1990s, late 1990s, again, with the heavy marketing of prescription opioids to physicians. As a physician, we were told that there was a fifth vital sign. You checked your heart rate, your blood pressure, your respiratory rate, your temperature, and, oh, by the way, what's your pain level? And so we were told how to check people's pain, and if people were having pain, and we believed that we have to take care of all pain, well, you need to treat it. And what better medication than an opioid? Ironically, we had learned that opioids were very good for cancer pain, but now heavily marketed for all kinds of pain. The second, if you will, rise or portion of the epidemic occurred when heroin. Again, now we have people who are addicted to opioids. Physicians are encouraged not to prescribe as readily, but unfortunately we have people who are addicted. And so as a result, people started turning to heroin. It's inexpensive, it's readily available, and it gives you a very quick high. And then most recently, as I've mentioned to you already, the uh, illicit manufacturing of fentanyl, which is really sort of very horrific in that your fentanyl that's, you know, hundreds of times, tens of times stronger than morphine than a lot of the over-the-counter medications. And people are using it not knowing that they're using it and finding themselves having untoward effects. This is a map going back to 2012. Let's look at prescriptions. And again, the darker the more prescriptions, and this is 2012, when again across the United States it peaked, and you can see primarily in the southeast and uh, midwestern country, midwestern states, this is rates per 100. 2017 significantly better, albeit still significant high levels in the southeastern states and Midwest. And then for Washington State, this is 2017, and again you can see Whitman County looks really good. Spokane doesn't look as good. And then that county just south of Soton has some of the highest rates in the state, and it still does, unfortunately. More maps, and again, I just thought this was interesting. This is currently off of the Department of Health's website. This is a dashboard that looks at prescriptions, opioid prescriptions per 1,000 residents in the county. 
And you can see that the state total is about 61. Across, across the nation right now, it's in the high 50s, low 60s. So that's about what you would expect to see from a national norm. Whitman, about, again, the same as the state level. Spokane, a good bit higher. And that's historically how we've seen Spokane as a, the urban center for the inland northwest, unfortunately, has higher rates of a lot of problems associated with addiction and also causing the addiction. And this was interesting because of the fact that this is a combination of not only opioids but also other medications like benzodiazepines. And you see in this situation that both Whitman County and Spokane actually have higher rates than the state. So this is com com combining something like hydrocodone with something like a benzodiazepine like Valley or things, medications like that. And again, public health, I have to bore you with some, with some numbers, so bear with me. But again, you can see these are graphs looking from 2000 to 2017. And overall, we see that there's been a gradual trend in overall overdoses. That's the black line. And you can see below that many of the numbers have sort of leveled off. We actually see prescriptions, which is the sort of blue-green line going down, which is great. But then at the bottom, we see synthetic opioids, which again is the fentanyl, tramadol, ultram, as going up. And this is just a better looking curve, a little smoother, but again, compare this, if you will, state level, to here's Whitman. So on the back. So on average, 14 overdoses per one for, uh, for 100,000. And again, Whitman County, better than the state average overall for overdoses. Going down for all opioids. When they say all opioids, that's including both the illicits as well as prescriptions. Spokane is still up there. Just a different way of looking at the graphs again. So blue represents 2017, green is 2018, yellow is 2019. The uh, data for 2019 are not uh, validated as of yet, but it kind of gives you an idea of where we're going. And you can see that definitely with respect to opioids, yeah, you know, we're about saying about the same between 2017 and, and 2018. That third graph, that third set of bars to the left, unfortunately, represents methamphetamine. And Dr. Roll will talk about that in a little bit, but I would encourage you to be aware of the fact that oftentimes people use more than one substance, polysubstance use. Methamphetamine is back. Methamphetamine is back in a big, 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 big way. And in urban centers, it again is a real bane, but it's also available readily in rural areas as well. Whitman looks pretty good. Looks much better than Spokane. And this, gen this is just a little diagram to show you es essentially what we looked at in 2018 was we had about 735 deaths across Washington State opioid related hospitalizations, almost you know 14,000 plus uh, admissions for substance use, and again the number of individuals who are misusing pain medications. I think it's important to look at who. You know, the reality is that if we look at the opioid epidemic, one could argue that drug, drug usage and drug misuse has been around for decades, but it's oftentimes been hidden. It's been inner cities. It's been in slums. It's been in environments where, again, people don't look like us. And it really only seemingly came to people's awareness and visibility when it started to affect whites when it affected young, white, middle class, young, poor whites. But unfortunately, if you talk to anybody who's lived or worked in an urban setting, like Baltimore, like Camden, like New York City, like San Francisco, like Oakland, drug usage and drug misuse has been around. It never disappeared. Okay, Heroin has, again, been the drug because it's readily available. But when prescription opioids became sort of like the cause celeb, all of a sudden it became something of great note. And yes, we know that as we've talked about, a significant number of people are dying of overdoses. But again, we need to be, re be really cognizant of the fact that this is not just a problem of whites. It's a problem of all races and ethnicities in our country and disproportionately affecting the poor. So if I look at, for example, Native Americans, I can tell you that the rate of overdoses has increased 
between 1999 and 2015. It's, it's increased less so in whites, but do you hear about the fact that those rates have increased so significantly in Native Americans? No. But we're very much aware of the fact that it is impacting whites. African Americans have also been affected significantly. 170% increase, especially in heroin and fentanyl overdoses over the last few years. But overall, statistically, what we're seeing across the country is that who it is impacting the most tends to be white males, 25 to 44. But overall, statistically, what we're seeing across the country class. is that who it is impacting the most. I say that, most, but again, tends to be use, white males, 25 to 44. But misuse, overall, statistically, what we're seeing across the country is that who it is impacting the most. I say that, most, but again, age, gender, or socioeconomic status. It affects everybody. Tough to read, but again, this just sort of shows, up, if you will, the small little circle is very <coughs> difficult, but it's sort of the upper curve. That represents uh, white non-Hispanic. The uh, squares at the bottom represent black non-Hispanic, and you see sort of a gradual increase in opioid overdoses. Uh, this is, again, national data. Washington State doing better, if you will, than the national data, but again, still significantly high. And then again, this curve just looks at the fact that in all age groups, it's been going up, but again, disproportionately in the population that I mentioned, the age group that I mentioned. I talked about vulnerable individuals, vulnerable populations, pregnant women, okay? When, when a woman learns that she is pregnant, it is oftentimes a great motivator to try to address a medical issue, to try to address opioid use addiction. Unfortunately, women are stigmatized. They're very concerned when they're identified as having opioid use disorders that they may get referred to CPS, Child Protective Services, and they may lose their child after birth. And so they're very reticent about being seen by a physician. They're also really, really oftentimes not given the medication they need to by physicians because, again, a lot of physicians don't know that using medications like buprenorphine, like methadone during pregnancy, are actually provide better outcomes for children. So again, there's a real stigma associated with women who are pregnant, but yet it's an incredibly ideal time to get them into treatment. Adolescents, less than 10 to 25%, less than a quarter of adolescents are actually getting treatment that they need for opioid use disorder. Seniors. When you look at seniors, and you're looking at is what they should take. They take a full tablet and they have an overdose. It also serves as a prime source for diversion. Diversion it means that, oh, you know what? A full Grammy has these, has, has these medications on her medication. It also serves as a prime yes. source for diversion. Look at diversion means that, oh, you know what? Grammy has these, has, has these medications on her And so we know that, yes, a significant percentage of individuals will become addicted by prescription medications, but it's not always prescription medications that are provided to them. It's oftentimes from others, from friends, from family members. <coughs> Co-occurring disorders, John will talk about this, but again, there's a real combination oftentimes of people who suffer from mental health problems and substance use. One may find that oftentimes people who have mental health issues who don't have access to treatment, they may be self-medicated. People who are incarcerated, Okay. This is a priority population for the governor across the state because, again, disproportionately, we know that people who are incarcerated oftentimes suffer from mental health and or substance use. Just using local data in, in Spokane, 60% of individuals who are currently incarcerated have either been treated for a mental health issue or a behavioral health issue within the last year. And yet there's a lot of reticence about prescribing medications to those in individuals incarcerated in the jail for reasons that, again, are mostly social, structural, institutional. But again, I argue that if the first place somebody who has an addiction comes in contact with the medical system is a jail, that's not right. It's doing them a disservice, and it's doing us as a society a disservice. <coughs> Populations of color, as I said, disproportionately affected. Interestingly enough, again, sort of, there's been this mindset that African Americans and Hispanics don't feel pain the same way as whites. And so prescriptions are oftentimes given out differently to people of color. I don't understand that. Homeless, 
again, a vulnerable population, something that we're dealing with significantly up in Spokane. I ask the whys, and again, in public health, we come back to what's called the social determinants of health, the social and material factors that describe the environments in which people live, grow up, work, and play. And the reality is that, yes, biology and genetics do <coughs> contribute a significant percentage to someone's potential of being addicted. But I can tell you that nobody wakes up one day and says, you know what, today I'm going to become addicted. But if all they know is dysfunction, if their environments are surrounded by dysfunction, if their parents unfortunately suffer from addiction, then that's a norm. And you know, I've heard one presenter say, you know, people take medications, take substances of abuse for two reasons. They either want to feel something or they don't want to feel something. And I would argue in conversations that many people don't want to feel the pain that they are suffering. And so again, I think that in public health, we're looking at upstream causes. We're dealing with a lot of outcomes of, again, environments. Public health, if you as community members really want to impact your community, you will look to how you can address adverse childhood experiences, how you can create nurturing environments, and how you can build resiliency in children to, again, address the, dis the dysfunction that they're dealing with. This is a little bit about ACEs. And maybe you've heard this phrase, deaths of despair. This was coined by, interestingly enough, two economists a couple of years ago. But what they noted was that at that time, and now unfortunately for the last three years, we've actually seen statistics that would suggest that children born over the last three years will actually have a decreased life expectancy as compared to individuals born a couple of years earlier. And what they found was that disproportionately, as I've shared with you before, the individuals who seemingly were dying at higher rates were whites, were people who had lost their jobs, people who seemingly did not have a way out. And so they coined the term diseases of despair, where people who had lost their so jobs. So this occurred sort of post-recession, <coughs> we know did not have a way out. Know, employment rates were again, so they coined the term diseases of despair, again, finding themselves with losses. So this occurred sort of post-recession, we know they're out was using drugs, using alcohol. And so what we found is that unfortunately, People over the last couple of years have died significantly greater rates due to substance use, alcohol use, and suicide. This is really upbeat talk, isn't it? <laughs> Sorry, this is public health. This is the world I live in. Sorry. So what do we do about this? Okay, well that's again, for me it's a call to action. For me, one of the reasons why I'm here and I'm really pleased to talk to you as, again, a diverse group of students and community members is that we need to address this, not in public health solely, not solely by asking the government to do something for us, but again, collective, it's collective action. And so this is the state opioid response plan that again has four goals, it's been in existence for a couple of years, all of us in public health are involved with it. And again, the focus is again, addressing misuse with youth, expanding access to treatment, naloxone as I mentioned, and then really making use of data. I thought this was an interesting slide. This is a slide that came, comes from a researcher out of, U, out of a University of Washington. I know he's a competitor here, but nonetheless, I think he's a really good researcher. And what he found in talking with people who were in syringe service programs is that disproportionately, they wanted, they wanted to address their addiction. They wanted some means by which they could lower their use or eliminate their use. And what they wanted was access to medication, primarily. Unfortunately, there's a real gap between those individuals who have access and those who need treatment. And so this again slide from the same researcher back in 2016, Affordable Communities of Health, ACH. I just referenced Better Health Together, which is us in Spokane. Imagine, if you will, that I've got 9,000 people in 2016 who have a diagnosis, a working diagnosis of opioid use disorder, of which only 2,000 people are undergoing treatment. Harm reduction, a concept that I want you to be aware of. Again, acknowledging that people are going to practice unsafe, unhealthy behaviors. How do we reduce the harm associated with those behaviors? Medication-assisted treatment, it works. Evidence-based treatment to show that people who have a chronic brain disorder will respond positively to treatment with appropriate medications. It's not replacing one drug of addiction with another. It's treating a chronic brain disorder. Syringe service programs, we had the first in the state. 
Again, very proud to say that we are a leader in that. And again, swing service programs, you're working with individuals, you're trying to prevent infections such as hepatitis C, HIV, and other problems again. Naloxone, I've mentioned to you already, peer support, more and more evidence to demonstrate that people who have suffered from addiction are going to be better able to work with people who are currently dealing with addiction than someone like me. Controversial supervised consumption sites, these are again people, these are sites, they've worked in Canada, they've worked internationally, where again, under supervision, under medical supervision, people are using injectable drugs. Interestingly enough, at the site in Vancouver, there have been no deaths. I just mentioned this bill, and again, policies, I know this is sort of a focus, and we're gonna be getting more information about that in a couple of days, but again, based upon the governor's opioid response bill, these are the areas of focus that that bill emphasizes policies around how to address the opioid issue. And I just always close with this. For me, this is sort of my call to action. This is Public Health 101. This is Public Health Definition by the Institute of Medicine. Okay. And many people say, what is public health? Oh, it's providing care for the underserved. It's providing vaccinations. I say it's a lot more than that. And this definition for me is very telling. I emphasize three words. I emphasize society, because I will argue that health is a social responsibility. I will argue that it's something that we collectively have to do. It's not something in public health, it's not something I as a physician can do on my own. No, it's collective, and it's a community. And then finally, it's the conditions, it's the environment. Because as I said before, people don't wake up one day and say, I'm gonna be addicted. People don't wake up one day and say, you know what, I wanna be homeless today. But unfortunately, if the environments set them up for that, then it's a challenge. And I think we have a collective call improve the environments in which people live, work, and play. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Well, it's great to be here. Thank you for the invitation. I graduated with a PhD here in 1994, so it's always good to be home. Some of you may remember Fran McSweeney. I was her graduate student, and she don't in touch with her. I think she's in Egypt today enjoying retirement. So let me just add on to what Bob has said here. I'm going to make sure we have some time for questions. Too. So we've talked about the opioid epidemic, but as Bob alluded to, what's next? And maybe that answer is methamphetamine. Let me give you a little bit of data here. <coughs> These are from my good friend, who I think Bob was calling a competitor, Caleb Banta Green, over at UW. I consider him a protege. We work hand in hand. We have many grants and partnerships. So we're, we're competitors on the football field, but not in the uh, public health research arena. Um, I'm going to walk over here, see if you can still hear me. This shows deaths involving methamphetamine versus cocaine and all opioids. So this is all drug deaths over time. These are opioids. And here we have uh, cocaine, but you can see this, this alarming uptick in methamphetamine deaths over time. I don't know if you can see it. I'm sorry. It's okay. This shows you uh, the rates per 100,000 of state uh, residents since 2003 until 2017 who have died from, uh, from methamphetamine. And you can see this unfortunate <coughs> steady increase. You can see some demographic data to there. One thing that's perhaps noteworthy is that the percent of these that also had opioids in their system when they died is relatively high, between 30 and 50 percent throughout. So there's a lot of that co-occurring use that Bob referred to. Um, <coughs> here's another way of looking at it. The uh, the Peach colored bars or area is opioid and methamphetamine together. Uh, the purple is methamphetamine alone, and the others are a couple of other combinations. So you can see is methamphetamine, I think, is, is killing people here. If we look at crime lab cases, you can see, uh, I just can't do this. I've got to walk over to this. <laughs> This is uh, methamphetamine here. You can see in 2004, before some of the, uh, the prescription regulations went into effect, and there was a lot of local manufacture, 
There's a lot of crime labs involving methamphetamine, but over time it's starting to rebound up. So methamphetamine is very prevalent in crime, criminal behavior. One more here looking at treatment admissions. The drug that's most commonly admit someone is most commonly admitted to treatment for is no surprise alcohol. Uh, probably also no surprise, the second most common until 2014 was marijuana. It is a drug that has potential, abuse potential. Uh, but you see this, uh, again, pretty steady rate of methamphetamine treatment admissions in the state for publicly funded treatment. So, okay. Now I can stay at the podium, I think. Those are all the ones that I needed to walk over there for. So why are people using methamphetamine? This will be sort of a quiz. Do you think it's because it's an anorectic? It uh, helps control your appetite. Absolutely guarantee you some people start using it that way. Unfortunately, that's often young women who are trying to control their body weight and achieve a certain body image. Uh, certain groups use it as a sexual enhancer. Uh, it's mixed with Viagra and Apparently that's an enduring combination. <laughs> it's also a powerful stimulant. In, in, in that I mean it has the ability to make you euphoric. It has the ability to keep you awake. It makes you feel invincible. So it has a lot of powerful stimulant effects. I would argue it's all of the above and perhaps some more. To sum it up, methamphetamine is a powerful reinforcer. And that's what I want to talk about reinforcement. So if I'm thirsty and I take a drink of water, the thirst goes away, neural circuitry is activated that you could think of as underpinning the F. Skinner type reinforcement processes. Drugs of abuse, as Alan Leshner, former director of NIDA once said, hijack that motivational system and hyperactivate it so that that behavior is driven to the exclusion of all other types of behavior. I'll, I'll give you another example, just riffing off what Bob said. Suppose that, let's pretend we're homeless and we live out on the street in Spokane and uh, it's cold. It's actually it's supposed to snow there Saturday, I heard. So it is cold. So it's cold. Uh, you might be wet. Um, you don't have any way to protect the few belongings you have. You're going to get beat up. You don't know where you're going to go to the bathroom. You don't know where you're going to drink water. You don't know where you're going to eat. You don't know where you're going to sleep. It's a pretty impoverished environment. And I believe we need a certain amount of reinforcement, positive reinforcement in our lives, almost in a hydraulic-like fashion. So in those situations, it almost drives somebody to seek something that's a powerful reinforcer, like methamphetamine. It's going to make you less hungry. It's going to keep you awake to keep people from stealing your stuff. It's going to give you a euphoric feeling that comes along with psychostimulants. Um, so in my mind, and I think the data would bear this out, all abuse drugs tend to function as reinforcers, most. Uh, drug reinforcers typically affect behavior in the same way as non-drug reinforcers. And in my mind, again, the hallmark of successful, try that again, the hallmark of successful drug treatment is the lowering of a drug's reinforcing efficacy. So how do you do that? How do you manipulate reinforcing efficacy? You can do it pharmacologically. Dr. Lutz talked about buprenorphine, methamphetamine. That's intervening, intervening essentially at a receptor level to block the drug from actually exerting its effect. Immunologically, actually a reporter asked me in the last couple months what surprised me the most in my career studying addiction, and I had to think about it, but I said it was that the immunologic treatments never caught on as much as I thought they would. There's a lot of research, Ryan probably knows about it, that was been going on since the 70s to essentially, well, maybe you know all about it, but you, um, we'll ask her, she looks like she knows. There was a lot of work done to uh, develop essentially like a flu shot for nicotine or heroin where the ligand would be destroyed before it could exert its effect. Uh, cognitively, these are the psychosocial treatments. And then environmentally, and this is where most of my work happens. So. How do, you, how do you manipulate an environment to reduce a drug's reinforcing efficacy? I'm going to have to go over here again. The, this is a, a study done by Nader and Wolverton in 1991. It's monkey self-administering cocaine. It's one representative monkey. And whenever anybody says that, be alert, because that means it's the monkey in the study that has the best results, probably. <laughs> <laughs> I must just say it's one representative monkey. 
when they're self-administering one milligram per kilogram of cocaine, and the choice is between that and a pellet of food, they take about 45% of the cocaine choices. Uh, as you increase the magnitude of the alternative source of reinforcement to four pellets or 16 pellets, you decrease the proclivity to self-administer cocaine. You can see it here when it's 0.3 mg per kg. They take almost all of the food, I mean all of the cocaine, when it's a choice between cocaine and one pellet, but as that magnitude increases, the proclivity to self-administer cocaine decreases. In my mind, that's going to be the heart of what I'm talking about. Let me show you a comparable study done with people, and I'm going to just catch up to this here. This was done by Steve Higgins at University of Vermont. We can talk about why people have to do studies like this later on if you want. But he gave uh, recreational cocaine users choices between 10, 10, 10 milligram unit doses of cocaine and money. So they would have a mirror, a straw, a line of cocaine. If they chose cocaine, they could snort it or insulate it, or they could choose five cents. When it was a choice between five cents and cocaine, 80% of the choices were for cocaine. But as you increase the magnitude of that alternative source of reinforcement up to $2, just like the food pellets in the monkey study, cocaine use really went away almost. So by increasing the magnitude of the alternative available in the environment, you could decrease cocaine use. I can tell you want to talk about this study, so I'll, I'll whip through these and we can at the end here. Um, so how do you turn this into a clinical intervention? Well, <laughs> there is a class of treatments called contingency management, or CM, and that's what I'll spend the rest of this talk on. CM has been used to treat a number of types of drugs of abuse. You can see them up there. Everybody here know what a meta-analysis is? Yep, most of you do. It's, it's like a pretty erudite crowd. Uh, um, <laughs> I'm going to say it anyway, just to remind myself. Uh, it's like when you have a bunch of studies that are similar, you pull them together and look at the effect sizes. You can compare them and get an overall effect size, if you will. Uh, a meta-analysis of contingency <coughs> management showed that it has about a 61% success full outcome in treatments compared to 39% for other treatments with which it's been compared. So it, it works pretty well. How does it work? This is a study from 1994. This was when cocaine was the drug that people said couldn't be treated. Uh, a football player, Lynn Baez, who just dried, died shortly after the draft. It's on the cover of Time as an untreatable type addiction. Uh, Steve Higgins, designed this treatment where he randomized cocaine-dependent individuals into one of two conditions. On the right, we have the incentive group where they got a community reinforcement, just call that treatment as usual, uh, psychosocial treatment. Then they had their urine tested twice a week, analyzed for benzoecanine, a cocaine metabolite. And if that urine sample was negative, they got a voucher that had a certain monetary value. The control group was exactly the same, except they got no vouchers. And what you can see, first of all, outpatient psychosocial treatment is hard to retain patients in. So in the, the control group, only about 48% of the patients stayed in for the eight-week trial. In the intervention group, about 75% of the patients stayed in. I'm standing here like I'm hiding this from you, but then I realize you can still see it. <laughs> um, but if you look at what, what's really impressed people at the time and still does, is if you look at the percent of participants who got over two months of cocaine abstinence in this trial, over half in the contingency management intervention were able to do that, compared to about a quarter in the standard group. This really got people's attention. This was done at the University of Vermont, and people weren't sure that Vermont cocaine addicts were really that representative. Um, so they replicated it in inner city Baltimore in a methadone clinic where there was no doubt in people's minds. Um, as I think you probably all know, polysubstance use happens. Methadone is a very good treatment for opioid addiction, but you can still have a lot of cocaine use in that population. So essentially, they replicated that exact study, and here's what they found. Since it's methadone, everybody <laughs> wants to come in and get dosed. Retention is pretty equivalent, but if you look at those getting about 50% those getting more than two weeks of two months of cocaine abstinence, about half did in the contingency management condition and nobody in the standard condition. So that was a pretty positive outcome. 
one thing to say about that is it's not just giving people vouchers. So you come in for 12 weeks and you give a urine sample twice a week. The first voucher, say, is worth $5. The second one's worth 6 The next one's worth 7 This escalation voucher magnitude seems to be super important to string together instances of consecutive abstinence, which, which is what you're really going for, strings of abstinence. If you come in and you're positive or you don't test, the value is reset back down to the original low level. That's crucial. Um, <clears throat> so let me take this to methamphetamine now. Um, a great colleague of mine, which I would say she was my, my prime research partner. She died about a year ago. Uh, she was 49, but uh, she and I did most of these studies together that I'll show you now. This is uh, how we did them. They were national randomized trials. People were randomized to intake uh, to either contingency management or contingency management plus treatment as usual. Uh, they were distributed all over the United States, many different clinical sites were where they were conducted, and then there was a six-month follow-up. Nancy changed it up a little bit, and instead of using vouchers, she developed something she called the fishbowl procedure, the prize procedure, the variable magnitude of reinforcement procedure, whatever you want. And there, instead of vouchers, you got to reach into a bowl and draw a prize, if you will, each time you were negative for a drug. 50% uh, were dislabeled, good job, they had no monetary value. You can see there, some were small, some were large, and there was one jumbo <coughs> in, the, in the bowl. Um, this was done as a way to contain cost. And uh, let me show you, Ben, can you help me with that? Let me just show you a video of what this looks like, and then we'll look at some data. This is a study out of UW using this procedure, and of course all these people provided consent for their images to be used, et cetera, et cetera. For a certain name, I have you do a UA. So if you don't mind, we'll just have you take this and okay. stand up and do Okay, I'll do that. Great. Great. Thank you so much. So we are going to check this here. How's day been? Pretty good. 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 So now we're looking to see that you are clean for cocaine, amphetamines. Methamphetamines, THC, and heroin. So since you've been in the study for four weeks, that means you get five drops. Sound good? Yeah, sounds good. Excellent. Okay. Okay, first draw. Good job. Nice. Got back in there. So one thing to notice about that is everybody seemed like they were having fun. And drug addiction treatment is generally not fun. It's about focusing on where you've screwed up, by and large. Some clinicians in here might say I'm being overly harsh, but generally that's what it is. You used, that's a problem. What are we going to do about it? Here you're celebrating successes. And I think that's one of the things that leads to the great outcomes I'll show you here. And I am really going to fly through these because if you know if it didn't work, I wouldn't be showing you these. So here's a study of uh, psychostimulant use, including methamphetamine and methadone maintained people, about 400 people. Let's look at this 
graph over here. This is uh, negative samples over a 12-week intervention. This is the contingency management group. This is the treatment as usual group. At all time points, people are significantly more likely to be absent in the CM group. Another one, these are patients not in uh, methadone, so just straight psychostimulant outpatient treatment. Same thing. The uh, open circles represent the contingency management group, closed triangles, <coughs> treatment as usual group. If we focus in on methamphetamine use uh, specifically, we find that these are people who are absent throughout the entire 12 weeks of the study, three months of continuous absence. Almost 20% in the contingency management group compared to about 5% in the treatment as usual group. <clears throat> and if you look at that over time, 12 weeks, the orange bars or the orange line rather is contingency management and the blue bar is treatment as usual, the blue line. It works. It's a great way to treat methamphetamine addiction. Here's another one. I'm going to skip that. Um, contingency management is scalable can be delivered in many settings. It doesn't require a lot of training. You can uh, vary the magnitude and the schedules. Currently, we're helping teams in uh, the United States, Brazil, and Africa do this. Uh, is it cost effective? Yes, it is. We don't have time today to get into those details, but there's a number of studies, including the first two from our group, showing cost efficacy. Uh, and I'll wrap up showing you an example of contingency management being uh, implemented on a large scale. This is in the Veterans Administration uh, who has adopted it. And in the VA, they conclude this by saying that the VA's CM implementation initiative has resulted in widespread uptake of CM and produced attendance and substance use outcomes to those who equal to those found in controlled clinical trials. So, it starts off with animal research. That's what I love about it. It starts off with really basic, unequivocal, good, solid data of animal models. It goes through human laboratory models, into clinical models, academic clinical settings, and then out into the real world, and it still seems to work. I think it should be a frontline treatment, um, which I just said. So, it's the last slide. So, I I want to go back to a bigger picture for these last two bullet points. Are the opioid epidemic and the threatening <coughs> methamphetamine epidemic really about drugs? I might say no, they're not. I'm pretty confident that the opioid epidemic will sooner rather than later be a historical footnote, a tragic one, but I'm optimistic we'll get that under control. But I don't think it's so much about opioids or methamphetamine as it is about the environments, the social environment in which people are existing. Back to Bob's comments about diseases of despair. As long as there is despair or a lack of hope, it's human nature, if you will, to want to find ways to alleviate that, to have pleasure in your life. And unfortunately, drugs are an easy way to short circuit uh, those systems. And the last thing to me, after a career of treating addiction, is that it's, it's really unsatisfactory to be treating something that is almost entirely preventable in my mind. If we can arrange pretty trivial situations like I just showed you to get people to stop using drugs, why couldn't we put those sorts of reinforcing uh, opportunities in place in a prevention mode to prevent it from again in the beginning? Thank you. Saved a few minutes for questions. Sorry. <laughs> So we've got about uh, just five minutes for some Q&A. Yeah. Anyone want to start us off in the back here? Yeah. So you looked at um, like rewards and different stuff like that for people who are not using. Would you support something like, um, is looked at in some different states like uh, drug testing for welfare recipients or something where the reward is you know, more government administered? I'd have to see more details, I guess, of the program. I, I wouldn't single out one group, welfare recipients, necessarily for that. Uh, there are lots of places where you get drug tested to be able to work, though. So. Sorry, that's kind of a waffle answer I'm aware. <laughs> John, what, what, what do you think is the, the largest political problem to adopting the types of treatments that you're recommending? I think there's a couple. Uh, there's a perception that we should not be paying people to do what's right. Um, and, and I'm sympathetic to that. Uh, we shouldn't be rewarding people for engaging in bad behavior. But 
these data, if this were a drug, this contingency management, it would be the most valuable addiction treatment drug out there by far. And so I think I can counter that argument by saying this saves lives. This keeps kids from going to their parents' funerals. Um, so that's one. The other one is we're struggling to get CMS to fully reimburse this. Uh, because if your reinforcement gets people to come into attendance, it looks like you're paying people to attend treatment, and that would be Medicare fraud. So th there's some issues. Up here. Uh, I'm just curious. I'm sorry if I missed this or either of you addressed this, but I was curious, especially when you were talking more about like historically when opioids were like becoming more common in the U.S. Why do you think it's that this is like seemingly more of an issue now? Like you're more addicts and there's more people who are dying from this than when it was first introduced and it was arguably easier to get a hold of like it was over the counter it was like in different products like cough syrup and things like that like why is it and there's more information now so why is it a bigger issue now i think a couple of a couple of reasons um i think as john mentioned as i mentioned i think our environments are a significant contributor as to why people choose substances um, I don't think, you know, back in the day when morphine was readily found in cough medications or in sleeping aids, um, people were still dying, people were still overdosing, but yeah, not to the degree that they're doing it now. I think that what we see now is that, as I alluded to in the diseases of despair, as John mentioned, I think that we find people right now don't find ways out. You know, they are seeing themselves seemingly in situations where they are, have lost hope. And in doing so, I think in having these environments, people look for a way out. I mean, people may choose alcohol, people may choose drugs, people may choose different types of addictions. Are there, sorry, sorry, are there higher rates of poverty now? Are only, there higher rates of poverty and now? Homelessness, yeah. Well, I mean, certainly if you look, for example, at rates of poverty, there's no question that poverty in some circles, in some environments, has increased. You know, and as you know, as we've talked about, I think when people are finding themselves in those impoverished areas, both monetarily and culturally, then they will choose to find an out. And in those situations, substance abuse may be the out. Let me try to get someone back here. Oh, um, we're wondering what, uh, what are some of the factors that have changed um, kind of the methods and the ways we think about drug addiction and treatment over the last 30 or 40 years? Uh, I think there's more of a recognition that it's not a, a moral problem. Sometimes I like to say it is a moral problem, but it's the morals of society, not the morals of the user. Um, but I think we have recognized that it's a societal problem, not a problem related to a deviant individual. That would be my biggest one. Yeah, I think I would just echo that. I mean, now, I mean, you can actually look at functional MRIs. You can look at a variety of ways that we can understand how the brain functions or how the brain doesn't function appropriately. And then again, you know, that's something that I didn't learn, you know, 30 plus years ago when I was in medical school. But now medical students understand that. That's a big change. Yeah. yeah, so I have a question for each of you, if you will. Um, Dr. Lutz, right? Yes. Okay, yeah. Um, so, actually about a month ago, I was in downtown Eastside, um, Vancouver, Canada, um, kind of like the ground zero for our drug addiction case studies. I was actually there for my honeymoon. We got the wrong Airbnb, but... Uh, <laughs> you kind of look at it. Yeah, you look at Thank you. You look to your right, you see um, people just enjoying the restaurants. That's your left, people on the sidewalk. So, <clears throat> ambulance picking them to overdose. I mean, that's, uh, they've got clinics there for like harm reduction clinics where um, people go to not only be supervised and watched with their consumption of heroin, but um, also different ways to get them right back reintegrated into society um, by um, teaching them skills like um, how, to, how to talk to a person, how to sign in, do a resume, things like that. Um, what do you, where do you think Washington stands at the moment with um, harm reduction clinics? Um, the, the, whole, the maybe political philosophy as well as in the medical public health field. If you, I mean, if, if specifically you're looking at safe consumption sites, yeah. I would say that the pendulum is still leaning towards not in, towards avoidance of them. Although the, the research dem definitely demonstrates that they work, I think the political winds aren't necessarily supportive of that. 
I think the other complicating factor is that in the minds of many, people conflate syringe service programs where people come in and they pick up syringes with, say, with, uh, with the sites that you're talking about. We've been very successful in syringe service programs, and again, from a harm reduction standpoint, the concern is that because of that conflation, we're concerned because people do not want to ex ex essentially provide that safe environment for people to consume drugs by having them observed, and therefore, there's been threats that they're going to close down our syringe service program because of that misunderstanding. So we have time for one last question. So do you think the, the use of some recreational something like the marijuana or like laughing gas will lead to the abuse of uh, drugs? I'm, I'm sorry, if, if, if I think recreational use of fentanyl and nitrous oxide will lead to other drug use? Uh, yeah. Marijuana. 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 marijuana lead to other. Uh, I think it's possible. I can't see who asked the question. I'm sorry. Right oh, right there. Um, I don't think it's like if you do this, it causes this. I think there are many mediators and moderators of that relationship, but I do think that it is a risk factor. So. Okay, unfortunately, our time is up. Uh, yeah, let me remind you, if you're interested in the politics and policy side of this topic, come to our event 430 on Thursday here. And also, let me remind you, we have the uh, Japanese Consul General at 4 o'clock here today. Now, join me in thanking our guests for really informative.